Hi, I'm Rayburn Johnson. And I'm Steve Sensenick. And this is Beyond the Box. Here's your invitation to explore life outside the box of institutional religion. This is a place where there are no walls to restrict our search for truth as we embrace the ambiguity of defining our life in Christ. So unbuckle your seatbelt, recline your chair, throw caution to the wind, and get ready for the ride that is Beyond Beyond the the Box. Welcome back to Beyond the Box, everyone. It is always great to be back with you. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, Shane Hips, to talk about his book, Selling Water by the River, a book about the life Jesus promised and the religion that gets in the way. You are thoroughly going to enjoy this conversation. Um, Many of you might know Shane as the former teaching pastor at Mars Hill in Grand Rapids. Um, He was there for a number of years and has since left there and is actually writing and speaking and doing some different things. And I tell you, this conversation is so good. So we always say, unbuckle your seatbelt, recline your chair, (laughs) get ready, because I think you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation about selling water by the river. Well, folks, I am tickled to be joined by Shane Hips today on the podcast. He has a great book. I would say it's new, but I guess it's not as new now. It was it was new when we first started talking about doing this podcast. <laughs> uh, it's called Selling Water by the River, a book about the life Jesus promised and the religion that gets in the way. Shane, thank you so much for joining us on Beyond the Box today. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. This is a very excellent read. I've read through it twice, as I was telling you a moment ago, and Uh, The thing that I really like about it, Shane, is I read a lot of theology books and just a lot of um, books that really go, you know, in depth into exegetical stuff and all this. And your book, I feel like, delivers such a punch in a way that's accessible to anyone. And it's something that um, I came away from this book with so many nuggets and I didn't have to sweat for them. <laughs> oh, I'm so thank you. I'm delighted. No, that's the objective. That's all. It's always a great delight when when somebody has that experience. You, ho- hopefully, I did the sweating on your behalf, and that was the goal. <laughs> that was the goal. So. Well, it was very, very good, and uh, I want to encourage our listeners, if you get a chance to pick up a copy, you definitely need to go do that. Um, You and I were talking just before we started recording a little bit about your journey. Um, For those who aren't familiar with you, Shane, you were the teaching pastor at one time at Mars Hill Church in Grand Rapids. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, in the church and where you're at today and how you got there? Yeah, sure. No, it's kind of a huge question. Sure, sure. (laughs) I, 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 um, I sort of uh, started going to church really in college. So I, did, I, I was a Christian, actually. My parents were Christian, but they were uh, traveling all over the world. So they never found the American Christian context to be very connecting for them. So I, I never had a real strong connection to the church until I went to college where I really fr- flirted with fundamentalism and found a Bible church to be pretty life-giving and enjoyed it. Um, not long after that, I did a lot of deconstruction. This is 15, 20 years ago where I started to see the ways in which there were some limits to the fundamentalist approach um, and left a lot of it behind, but actually mostly with gratitude. I, I know a lot of people feel quite wounded and understandably so by the conservative expression of Christianity. Um, but for some reason I felt kind of, uh, I voluntarily chose it. So I didn't feel it was forced on me. And when I left it, I also voluntarily left it behind. Um, So then I went to Fuller, and during that time, I I really became uh, Anabaptized. So if you're familiar with the Mennonite brand of faith. (laughs) Very much. we uh, um, A huge part of what we talk about on the podcast is nonviolence, and uh, we have heavily Anabaptist leaning. (laughs) Yeah, sure. So what I loved about the Anabaptist tradition was um, they have a really, really earthy understanding of, of Christian life, which is, uh, it's like Jesus put his foot there, so we'll do the same thing. We'll try to put our foot there too. And then if there's any disagreement about Muhammad or Buddha or anything else, we're not really all that interested in that debate. And and uh, the afterlife and all that stuff kind of is fine and useful. But ultimately, um, they, they had this wonderfully grounded, open-hearted, humble, but still radically committed faith. I liked that. Mm. So for me, that patterned and, and modeled what I considered a third way beyond kind of human 
mainline liberalism and conservative dogmatic Christianity. And so I found tremendous life in a category that didn't really fit the categories. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I served as a pastor there for about five years at a small 300-person church in Phoenix. It was a Mennonite church. Loved it. Um, and then was eventually contacted by Mars Hill, and, and we had a number of conversations, accepted a call there to be the co-teaching pastor alongside my very good friend Rob Bell. And we spent uh, two years together and loved every minute of it. And then he uh, rightly, I believe, left the church to go do other things. And I stayed on long enough to kind of transition the church into the next leader, who is Kent Dobson, and uh, was very glad to do that. So those were, those were that's sort of the, the big broad strokes. Um, what happened to me as I kind of left fundamentalism, went into Anabaptism, I also had kind of, I wouldn't say a shedding of Anabaptism, it's still very much something I resonate with and appreciate. Um, but I would say that I discovered an, an element of Anabaptism that had a missing piece for me, which was, I'm probably at heart a bit of a, a mystic. Um, so the, the Gospel of John and his exploration of the inner life versus the exterior life I began to see the myriad ways in which there was an anemic expression of the inner life that was so potent throughout the Gospels and yet so often missed in all brands of Christianity. And mm. part of that is because Christianity is an institution and institutions are not well suited to cultivating the inner life. It's not their nature. It doesn't make them bad and wrong. It just means that's not their nature um, any more than it's not the nature of the tongue to hear notes. So mm. uh, that's, that's, what, that's what I sort of wrote the book that I wrote about, to sort of point people to what I believe to be the inner life that Jesus ultimately pointed us to and the gift that that could be. Mm. Mm. Now, as far as where you're at today, and uh, as you left Mars Hill, um, we were talking earlier, and, and you were saying that currently you're not, you don't really identify with uh, a particular church or a particular denomination or anything. Um, is that is that partly because you've not found that um, mystical connection with an institution? Because, frankly, like you said, they just can't give it to you. Yeah, I think there's a variety of reasons why I'm not I'm not connected to a church, not least of which is uh, when you're the tip of the spear of a movement the size of Mars Hill, um, th there aren't a lot of places you go after that. Um, yeah. And the reason I don't go to Mars Hill is really out of respect for Kent and to make sure we don't confuse leadership and all that stuff. Having said that, I, I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure I, I'm not sitting here with a great deal of longing. Um, most of the pastors that I know, well, maybe not most, but at least for me, I'll say, uh, one of the things that happens when I, be, when I became a pastor was you sort of have to no longer have a horse in the race. You realize that this is not for you anymore. And that, that sort of role of serving others, I started to realize I have to find my life elsewhere. So for years, I found other practices and techniques that became my version of church that had nothing to do with church. Uh, yeah. And so as a result, when I left church, it was very natural for me not to go find another church. It wasn't, wasn't a need for me. Yeah, very, very much. I uh, very much identify with what you're saying and where you're at. Um, in, in, in speaking of institutions and, and you know, finding, finding life in Christ apart from that, a huge part of your book, I mean, I love the title, Selling Water by the River. It's just kind of the, the irony of, of how... Uh, Christianity works. This idea that we have this stream of living water available that we kind of <laughs> sit beside and pedal and tell people how they can go about participating in this huge stream that they could walk right by us and jump in. It's um, actually a Zen koan. That's where I got the title from. Uh, mm. So Zen is a, uh, as a philosophy uses what are called koans, K-O-A-N. And they're uh, very bizarre statements designed to set the mind off uh, hmm. and off kilter and off balance so that you can penetrate deeper layers of reality. That's the way they do it. So, for example, they have these sayings like, what is the sound of one hand clapping? That's a Zen koan. Or, um, which moves, the wind or the flag? And that's all they say. And then one of their koans is, um, selling, uh, Zen is selling water by the river. And as soon hmm. as I read that, I was so struck by the sort of massive humility embedded in the very tradition that was trying to provide the water, it was suggesting we are absolutely redundant and unnecessary to the very thing we hope to be, and yet we will still exist. 
And I, I just love both the humility, the kindness to itself and others, and also just uh, the, the awareness that they'll still do what they do. And so mm. I loved that and said, what, what would it be like if we actually could imagine a world in which Christianity saw itself through that lens? Not mm. that it needs to get rid of itself to try to do that as like getting rid of the wind and the tides, but to understand and to live and exist with a great sense of humility. That's what the title was sort of designed for. Wow. Very good. Very good. Uh, you, you talk a lot about in the book about how Christianity tr- attempts to serve as kind of a gatekeeper for something that has no gate. <laughs> and we do this through things like beliefs and um, through practices. Can you talk a little bit about that and how how we move beyond this idea that we are the gatekeepers to God? Yeah. Um, so, so I think there's this sort of bizarre thing to me is not it, that that just because Christians claim Christ as their own does not mean that Christ claims Christians as his own. Mm-hmm. Th- there, there is no sense in the New Testament that Jesus is exclusive with Christians. He loves the people that are his part of his gathering. Um, but that doesn't mean he only loves them. It doesn't mean that he only claims them. The Samaritan woman is a great story. There are countless stories of people that are far outside the boundaries of what would be okay and acceptable. So um, the metaphor that I talk about that I use is that um, Jesus is like the wind and Christianity is like a sail. But I actually stretch that and go further and say all religions are sails. They're, they're all different sh- sizes, shapes, colors, textures, materials, all making efforts to catch the wind. And um, the reason that I don't say that, therefore, they're all equal is they're not all equal. Not all sails catch the wind the same way. Um, But then there's another layer to the metaphor, which is even if you have a subpar sail, um, if you know how to wield it, you can still wield and catch the wind better than someone Mm. with a much better sail. So when we run around and talk about, well, I've got the best sail, it's Christianity, I go, well, okay, that may be, but if a... Uh, a Jew knows how to wield a sail with incredible wisdom and humility, you might find you'll get left in the dust <laughs> or mm. in his wake anyway, because th- this is, this is a much more dynamic dance. And anyway, all that to say, Christianity's exclusive grip on Jesus is part of what I think is, is a mistake. And, wow. and it's a, it represents a level of arrogance. And I think it also is a misreading of when, we, when people claim, well, Jesus said that the church is the bride of Christ. Okay, well, that's fine, um, but it doesn't mean that he can't have other relationships. <laughs> and yeah. so so um, I, I'm okay with that, but I, I, I don't, I'm not at all convinced that the, what the church is today is a, that Jesus would come back and be a Christian. Mm, yeah. You know, it reminds me, um, I heard someone say one time, they were talking about how humans in their, in their because we're so finite, we can only have one favorite. And if we have one favorite, it means it's to the exclusion of all others. Mm. You can only have one favorite ice cream. You can only have one favorite food. You know, you can only have one favorite football team. And yet it seems like with God, he's saying we're all his favorites. Mm -hmm. And, And that's just such a huge thing that we just have a hard time wrapping our minds around. And it seems like we want to cast God in the mold of our image. And we want to... We want him to have a chosen people and a and a favorite and a special relationship. And somehow it seems like it makes us feel like we're that that it somehow takes away from us if God treasures someone else or he treasures another religion. It it begins with the fundamental belief that there's actually a limit to this, that there's a deprivation yeah. and a scarcity. So mm-hmm. do you have kids by chance? I do, yeah. How many kids do you have? Two, two okay, boys. So you, you fell in love with your first boy. Um, how much of the love from your first child did you have to take away in order to start loving your <laughs> second child? <laughs> None at all. Right. So where did None that love come from? Yeah, like, that's where great. did you go find it? Did you partition it from somewhere else? Because there's only so much to go around. So <laughs> you had to go, is there like a hand-me-down love? Or Obviously not. And, and right. yet, this is not a mystery to us. We somehow are quite comfortable with this. Why on earth do we believe this is a finite bounded set around God's chosenness? And I'm not, I, I'm not saying that people are crazy for believing it. I certainly understand why people get there. The Bible sure. is full of exclusive claims at certain places. 
that's fine. But you also notice the Bible is an ongoing expansion. It records an expansion of love over time. Yeah, and I want to talk about that some um, because I know you you talk about uh, kind of cutting your teeth in a more fundamentalist environment. And both Steve, my co-host, and I have done the same thing. And so we've been moving for the past decade towards a more open view of Scripture that really – you know, I'm I'm less and less comfortable with calling Scripture the Word of God because I, you know, I believe that title only belongs to Jesus, and therefore, more and more, I'm viewing Scripture as a very human book with very um, human earmarks um, that God chooses to use. Uh, with that said, how how do you how has your understanding of Scripture evolved over the last several years as you've kind of come to a more open view of God? Well, oddly enough, I, I don't know that it's my view of Scripture that's changed. It's my view of myself that's changed. So um, one of the things I talk about in the book early on is, is lenses. And this is, of course, in the theological terminology hermeneutics. But it's much simpler to just say, you know, a lens is something that bends and blocks light. That's its only function. And what that means is it will diminish some things and amplify others. The most amazing thing about a lens is, A, if you consciously choose it, you can determine what things will come into focus and what things will not, what things will be distorted and what things will be deleted. This is what's amazing about lenses. The most dangerous thing about lenses is believing we don't have them. So Mm. what's changed or evolved about my view of Scripture isn't about Scripture at all. It's about the lenses that I have carried over the years. So for a long time, I was given a lens by authority figures that said the Bible is flat, it's inspired, it's inerrant, uh, it's to be taken literally. Okay, well, that's fine, but that has nothing to do with the Bible. That has everything to do with the lenses, the prior assumptions that I brought to the Bible. Every time I have a debate with someone about what the Bible says, I find it an enormous waste of time unless we begin with, what do you actually bring to the Bible? What do you actually yeah. believe about it? And then we can have a helpful conversation. Um, yeah. So my, my lenses today are different than the lenses I had 10 years ago, but the lenses I have today are not fixed either. I'm quite mm-hmm. comfortable interchanging them because I realize mm-hmm. I'm not changing and not messing with the Bible. I'm messing with me, and I'm free mm-hmm. to do that. So I, I actually yeah. hold the Bible in very, very high regard. I, I just don't hold my own sense of uh, total understanding in high regard. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, mm-hmm. my lenses include things like uh, I, I tend to have a, a Jesus-centered lens. And the reason that I do that is because Jesus actually elevated some parts of the Bible over others. So I don't have a flat view of the Bible. When the Pharisee said to him, what are the greatest commandments, he had an answer, which is astonishing because the 630-some commandments, they're not suggestions, they're commandments. How could you elevate one above the other? And yet he had the audacity to say, actually, these two, those two matter more than all the others. In fact, these no. two, you've got to read everything through those two. That is incredible. So we have no. then permission to say, why don't we read the Bible the same way, to say those two, love God and love your neighbor, everything else in Scripture then is subordinate to that. And uh, so I love that. I like to do that. I also have a lens that is um, rooted in a belief that Scripture, which is um, a series of documents that have been written over long periods of time, actually document not just content, but process. And the process is the ongoing expansion of human consciousness. That, That at one phase in human history, tribalism was a necessary way to survive, And tribalism is incredibly exclusive. But then later in history, tribalism fades away. And you see that in the teachings of Jesus. So so I think there is an ongoing evolution of humans throughout Scripture, which is why I'm very comfortable going, yeah, I think I'm going to take Jesus over this part because it was much, much older. It's not invalid. It's just incomplete. Yeah. Which really, in in my mind, and something we've talked a lot about on the podcast over the last five years is it almost begs the question of the necessity of the word canon. You know, it's almost like, to me, the idea of canon is this really closed set that you measure, the ruler by which you measure everything else. I mean, that's literally what it means. So it's almost like, how can you do that if this progression in our relationship and understanding of God, if it is indeed a progression and it's a progressive unveiling of the truth and of our understanding you know, in what sense can we really look at the biblical documents and, and, and call it 
the rule. You know, if God's, I mean, even within the canon itself, like what you're saying, if there's, if there's, if there's a contradiction in the sense of, you know, Jesus coming along and saying, okay, that worked for a time. It no longer works. I'm here now. I'm telling you something new. In what sense can we make the Bible kind of our gold standard if God's continuing to move beyond that? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting. My experience of the Bible is that there are actually diamonds embedded in the rock of Scripture far beneath the level that we have ever dug or drilled. And so I continue to discover these extraordinary gems that it's as though they were planted there two millennia ago as time bombs, that when the culture and the consciousness of the world is ready, suddenly we become awake and aware of the deeper meanings of certain kinds of truths. And, and I think that's part of the beauty and mystery of this sacred text is that it actually has layers that are inexhaustible. Mm. That doesn't mean that I have a need for us to hold on to the Bible or protect it or anything. It just, it's just I look at it and go, it's quite a remarkable and beautiful sacred work and it's also human thoroughly human and i'm i'm really pretty comfortable with that so uh i guess that's why i don't have sort of an um a bible is kind of a bygone era but neither do i have a need to sort of defend or spend a whole lot of time protecting it yeah. i just know that when i preached and i had a series of experiences internally that i'd never had before and i went back to the scriptures i suddenly would read a parable and go oh my god Gosh, that's what he's talking about. Mm. I have never heard that. I've never seen that interpreted. And yet, something in me confirms there was a diamond in this rock that had not been mined. And that's what, that's what I w- was sort of taken with. And it really, you know, it really makes me wonder in hearing that if it's, if the chain, if, you know, because it's like you view the, as we grow and as we evolve in God, it seems like we see everything with new lenses, you know, like you said, it's not just scripture. You see the whole world all of life. So that you find yourself, you find yourself doing that all over the place. Yep. So I like what you're saying as far, you know, the Bible, the Bible being very human and yet that, I mean, humanity is that way. You know, it's like Ernest Becker talks about, you know, we're, we're a God who shits, you yes. know, <laughs> yes. I mean, right. it's, you know, we're, we have this, we have this diamond in this really rough facade. Yep. It's a, it's a really good analogy. Um, you talk a lot in the book about, and, and you mentioned this earlier, about the wind and the sail, about the analogy of the wind and the sail. And the idea that um, you talk in that chapter about the idea that the trajectory of any religion is to become brittle. So given that, what, what, should, be our, what should be our relationship with religion, do you think? I think our relationship with religion is is the same as any medium or technology or creation of man that we have on the planet, which is they go through, um, they have an in, inevitably beautiful purposes, they are inevitably fallen, and they're inevitably capable of redemption. And so understanding that, you know, Walter Wink has this great statement, which is uh, the world is fallen, the world is... Uh, beautiful, and the world is being redeemed. So, mm. so all of them are fine. So even the Pentagon has sort of a noble purpose. It has quite a beautiful and noble purpose, but it is also desperately broken. Uh, mm. Wall Street has quite a noble purpose, but it's desperately broken. Um, and so I think the church is like that. It's desperately broken, it has a noble purpose, and it's capable of being redeemed. Mm. Um, but I also don't have a need to redeem it either. <laughs> me personally, I think it's great. I, I just I'm very comfortable with the thought that if that sail ain't working for you, you don't. It doesn't prevent the wind from being in your life. <laughs> has that has that been a change in you personally? Because I know, you know, being in pastoral ministry, there is this. You can get this Messiah complex where you feel like it's your job to fix it. And I mean, I was here, I was in just a little, you know, podunk (laughs) fellowship. And I mean, you're, you know, you're at Mars Hill, one of the fastest growing churches in America. I can't imagine the, the temptation to think that, you know, you're the new, I don't know, savior of Christianity. You know, we're going to (laughs) bring, we're going to bring Christianity to this millennial generation and make it cool and make it, you know, what has that been a transition for you to kind of, let go of that? 
Uh, or did you ever have that? Maybe no, I had a different kind of Messiah complex, which played out in a small church. Um, and it had less to do with sort of being the savior of Christianity and had more to do with my own need to be needed. Uh, mm. So that was just a personality thing that I had to kind of grow through and out of after it burnt me out. Um, and then I realized, oh, oh, okay, okay. So maybe I don't have to be needed all the time. Maybe I don't have to be amazing all the time. Maybe actually my contribution is just an expression and an offering and the outcome is irrelevant. And so a huge part of where I became sort of liberated from that pattern, which is kind of an occupational hazard to most pastors, is when I learned to divest myself of all outcomes. I was after no objectives, no agenda, no goal, other than uh, the openness, letting people become free enough to feel open to connect with God, but always with an awareness that it was their choice. And so I didn't have a need to convince or persuade or cajole or be anything other than that. And so by the time I got to Mars Hill, I was pretty well kind of uh, deprogrammed. I think it's probably one of the reasons they were uh, attracted to me is that it, it wasn't, uh, that wasn't one of the things I had to go through. And because uh, I'd already done some of the work. So at Mars Hill, oddly enough, I didn't, I really didn't have that, that much of a different feeling about my purpose and role in the world. I just thought my job is to share my offer what I have. And in this case, it's a particular art of the spoken word, and so I'll offer that. And then if it's useful, great. And if it's not, that's okay, too. That's a great perspective <laughs> on it. It's a great perspective. It's funny how some of us, because I know I know for me, you know, it was a real to go from being, you know, Pastor Ray to Joe Schmo at the bookstore. You know, <laughs> that was a transition, you know. I mean, it was, a, it was an identity, you know. I had to really work to not find my identity in this calling or this, cause that, that can so, it just seems like that can become such an idol. Just as you talk about in the book that, you know, religion in, in general can become such an idol. Um, one of the things you, you talk about in regards to that is our beliefs and the sense of how our beliefs protect us and keep us safe, but they can also be constricting. Um, can you talk somewhat about the role of beliefs and maybe uh, how we misuse them and what their proper use is? So I, uh, I love to camp, and I, uh, I got really nerdy. I'm like a fire stoker. I'm a person who really loves to like perfect a fire and get it working just the right way. And so people make fun of me because I can't just sit down and relax at the fire because I'm like, oh, I think the flame's going down. Let's let's get the logs just right. <laughs> um, and as a consequence of my uh, part, partly my compulsion and my nerdiness, um, I, I started trying to figure out how to start fires without matches. So there's this great little tool that's just like a magnesium brick. Um, and then on one side, there's a little a bar that's embedded in the magnesium brick, um, just holds in the palm of your hand. And you take a knife and you shave off the magnesium into a leaf, let's say. And then you turn it over and you take that same knife and you strike the bar across the top and it creates these sparks. And when the spark hits the magnesium, magnesium burns at a really high rate and then it can ignite into a fire. So why do I tell you that? Um, well, I think believing is sort of like that spark. Um, but I actually think knowing is what we're here to do. And there's a difference between believing and knowing. Knowing is the flame. Believing is the spark. Belief is what you have to get you from, the, from nothing into the thing that can actually provide you with warmth and cooking for your food. A spark mm. can do none of that. Mm. So belief is a very interesting thing. There's a tremendous amount of emphasis on it in the Christian world, in part because of the way that one of the words in the Bible was translated into, into, from Greek into English, which is faith or belief, and it gets used a lot. But in, in Christianity, uh, in the modern world, we hear belief and we think cognitive assertion, cognitive assent, agreement in my mind, all the furniture in my mind is arranged in just the right way. All of the words are ordered in the right sequence in order to make sure that I actually will flip a switch somewhere metaphysically or cosmically and it will allow me to then have a new experience. Now, <laughs> the problem with all of this, of course, is that belief cannot do that. It is not its nature. It's not how it's made. The mind cannot access the kingdom of God mm. any more than the ear can taste a kiwi. It just isn't its nature. It doesn't make it bad or wrong. It's just not its nature. What it can do is provide a nice little bridge until you get to the point of knowing. Mm. Knowing 
is when you've actually eaten the steak. Once you've eaten the steak and you've tasted it, there's no debate about it anymore. Mm-hmm. I could come up to you and say that steak isn't real and you would simply laugh. There's, you wouldn't even debate it. There'd be nothing to discuss. So um, I, that's the other metaphor I use is, is belief is the menu and knowing is the meal. And if you look at the Gospels, um, and particularly John, and you look at all of John's writings from the Gospel all the way through Revelation, but particularly um, the Epistles, one, John 1 through 3, there is a, a transition as the community matures from the word believing to the word knowing. And more and more and more they talk about knowing, 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 instead of believing, believing, believing. So anyway, my, my feeling on it is that... Um, our beliefs are a powerful catalyst, but if we stay with them, they will disappoint us. Do you, given, given what you're saying there, do you think that things like um, the emphasis in the church on apologetics, for instance, do you think that that's a result of us uh, buying into the whole enlightenment project, which tells us that it is all about, you know, getting your beliefs right and dotting your I's and crossing your T's and all those kinds of things? I mean, do you think that that something like apologetics is an exercise completely in utility. Com- uh, it, it's, I don't know if it's, it depends on what its goal is. Um, yeah, I think it's completely born of the need to have everyone argued into a perspective. Um, m- my experience is that when I hold my little daughter in my arms and I feel her love and she feels my love and no words are exchanged, Belief doesn't enter into that. Mm -hmm. I don't believe anything about myself or her. I simply enjoy the experience. Mm. Um, This is why I go back to the menu and the meal. Apologetics is just a debate about the menu. Well, I'm hungry. And we can debate the menu all you want. I'm just really hungry. And if I paid a whole lot of money to sit in a nice restaurant and you showed me an elegantly designed menu and then after I read the menu, I got up and left, I would not be satiated. (laughs) <laughs> and that's most of what religion does. They're experts at curating, cultivating, and writing and debating the menu. And I lost all my interest in the menu. Um, mm. The menu's fine. It's it's nice. I, I like to know what's on the menu. But <laughs> but ultimately, uh, when you the, can't eat it, though. <laughs> yeah. And when the chef comes out and goes, "That's not on the menu anymore." The menu's irrelevant. Yeah. I just want the food. And amazingly, I can get the food without the menu. That's the mm. other remarkable thing about food. Um, And so the experience that Jesus talked about, promised, pointed to, which he calls Aeon Zoe in the Gospel of John or um, the Kingdom of God in the other Gospels, eternal life in the Gospel of John, this is a direct experience of Mm. of our existence and the miracle of our existence. Mm. And this is the heaven that exists now, not after we die. It's here. Um. What you find here, you find there. There's a reason there was an urgency in his message. Hmm. And if you don't break your chains while you're alive, do you think some ghost will do it when you're dead? Hmm. This, this is, you're here to discover this now. Jesus died, dead for three days, came back from the dead, and had nothing to say about the afterlife. No. Which I'd never, until I read your book, I'd, that had never even hit me. I thought, gosh. That's such a fascinating insight. So, yeah. So I, that's why there's something here in this life. Hidden in this life is a nutrient and a gift that most of us will not see as long as we are distracted by the surface of belief. Mm. And, and, you know, Shane, that's that's something that more and more my friend Steve and I that do the podcast, we uh, we more and more talk about things like, you know, creeds and doctrines and all these different things that we use to codify the faith and to determine who's in and who's out and all these kinds of things. And more and more I'm coming to, I'm, I'm right there with you. You know, I look at, I look at, you know, the, the debates about the atonement and about hell and about all these different things and go, gosh, we are so, we're so wrapped up in the menu that we're not enjoying the meal. I think you're, you're spot on. You're spot on. You, you talk a lot about fear and love in the book. And 
this has been something huge for me because it was so, I don't know if you, uh, if, if you're a little uh, OCD, but <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I definitely have uh, experienced those tendencies myself. And I heard you say something in the book that just made me really identify with you when you talked about how we shouldn't even be afraid of misidentifying our fear, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that, because I can, there, there's been so many times when, I've looked at what I feel like God's calling me to do, and I've been so concerned that I'm going to miss it, that I'm going to get it wrong, that I'm not going to do it just right. And how even that, uh, even the fear of maybe not walking in love enough is is missing it. Can you talk some about fear and love and and how we move from fear toward love? So um, the fascinating thing in my mind about this passage in John where he says perfect love casts out fear is that I realized that it was um, a metaphor rooted in light and darkness so that what we see as the opposites are light is one thing and darkness is the opposite and light casts out darkness that's its nature and then what I also realized is, of course, that darkness is not, in fact, the opposite of light. It is simply the absence of light. Mm-hmm. In the same way, there is no opposite of love. Love has no opposite any more than light has no opposite. There is only love and the absence of love. Mm-hmm. In the presence of love, nothing backs it down. In the presence of light, no amount of darkness can quench light. You could have darkness for millions of miles around and all it takes is one candle, and the, the area around will be illuminated. No darkness can quench or conquer that light. That is this power of love. So when we say perfect love casts out fear, we don't imagine it as some epic battle between love and hate or love and fear. Uh, it is simply the absence. And this is quite liberating, because then you're not in some epic fight. You're just in something as simple as, have you brought love into the situation? What, what might it illuminate? And the beautiful thing about love is it's sort of like light. Light has no agenda. Mm. The only thing that light does is show you what is. Then Mm. you get to choose. If you'd like to stub your toe, you're welcome to. Light can help Mm. you do that more easily. If you'd like to avoid it, now you have that choice. Without the light, you have no choice. This is what love is. It is ultimately freedom. It is the free, this is what God gave humans, the total freedom to make choices. This is love. And so love brought into any situation enhances choice, gives more freedom. And that choice could be to stub your toe if you want. (laughs) But you at least now have the choice. So um, fear is one of the things that that blocks or obstructs that, that's in the way of it. And when it's gone, fear merges. Um, So so one of the things that I, that's kind of been a, a side note, but one of the things that I observed over and over and over again in religious people is we have been trained within an inch of our life to be terrified. Yeah. Terrified that you're not believing in the right way, terrified that you didn't say the right thing, terrified that you might have betrayed your Savior, terrified that you aren't acting in moral accordance, terrified in so many different ways. Terrified that you're terrified. Terrified that you might not be terrified. <laughs> so I'm afraid that I might not be afraid enough. And Ugh. so people who feel liberated and relaxed, they may be like, well, you wear that you might be going to hell? Well, sh- wow, I better be frightened. I'm not sure. Am I frightened enough? And oh. so what, what was interesting is anytime I would bring kind of a perspective that was designed to give someone liberation from the chains they carried around their back, I watched them recoil and recant and resist and obstruct mm. and entrench out of sheer terror. Wow. And it occurred to me that sometimes the thing we fear the most is actually the thing there to set us free. It's actually the thing there to help us. And so that's when I started to see the connection with Jesus walking on water. So, I mean, everybody talks about this miracle. And, of course, the miracle of Jesus walking on water is this extraordinary overcoming of the elements and what an amazing, powerful miracle. It's, it's actually not that interesting. What's most powerful and interesting is the disciples thought he was a ghost. Hmm. They mistook him for something other than what he was. And so the thing they feared the most was actually there to save them. And that's a powerful image of what the way God comes to us sometimes is that the thing you fear the most is sometimes the thing there to save you. Mm -hmm. Um, And so those are just some of the ways I think about fear um, and love. 
And, so good. and eventually what starts to happen as, as more and more fear is shed and more and more love is allowed to bloom in your life, what starts to happen is we no longer ask the question, is this right or is this wrong, which are fear questions. Mm. We start to ask the question, what does love with a capital L require? Mm. In this moment, for this person, at this time, what does love require? That's a totally different orientation than, is that right or is that wrong? Should I do that or shouldn't I do that? Mm. Mm. See, the, the whole right and wrong thing, I mean, really, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what got us into this whole thing. The whole problem of trying to figure out what was right and wrong instead of what, just what you're talking about. Yep. Walking in love. Yep. That's so good. Yep. That's so good. You talk in the book, I love an analogy that you draw out. It's an analogy of the guard and the gardener. Mm -hmm. And and you talk about how the gospel is more like a plant than a painting. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of encapsulate that illustration and share the significance of it with people? Sure. When I was in um, uh, Paris, I saw the Mona Lisa. And um, it was encased in glass and probably had lasers and all kinds of humidity control and who knows what else. And there was a guard standing next to it in like fig leaf formation with his earpiece and scanning the crowd with a great deal of suspicion. And I began feeling uh, guilty of a crime that I had neither committed nor was I planning <laughs> to commit. So I tried to act natural, which made me only look at unnatural. Um, but I remember walking away feeling rather intimidated about that moment and, and understanding and respectable the fact that that is a sacred ancient painting. It's very, very, very fragile, very delicate, and it is in need of quite a bit of protection. Um, not long after that, I was at a botanic garden, and I was wandering through and looking at the plants and the trees, and I watched a gardener kind of perched on this ladder precariously high, and she had this long pole with this tiny little serrated blade, blade that was, she was threading between the needles of uh, the uh, branches of this tiny tree, of this big tree. And she was pruning it, and I noticed the way that she tended to things differently and how she made sure there was space and room for things to grow and how she also made sure there were weed eater guards around the base of the trunks and it occurred to me that this is an entirely appropriate way to handle plants. And then I thought it would be quite awful if you were to treat the tree the way you treated the painting and vice versa. Uh, you know, paintings don't take kindly to water and sun <laughs> and trees don't take kindly to glass boxes without sun or water. <laughs> and uh, so what my observation is is simply that I think for the longest time we have treated the gospel as an ancient artifact in need of great protection. And what happens is we become guards because that's what we believe about it. And if that's what you believe about it, you being a guard is quite appropriate. Uh, you're motivated by suspicion and fear, and you're terrified that it's going to get injured. But if you can see the gospel as something more powerful than you could possibly imagine, that could not be destroyed no matter how much you brought against it, in the same way that light cannot be destroyed, um, you might begin to see it as something that is organic, moving, and growing, and a more appropriate approach is something that gardens cultivates. And there might be some protective measures there, but for the most part, the goal is love, care, nurture, and participation in the mystery that is. Uh, the gardener cannot make a rose grow. It can only create the conditions that allow it to do its own thing. So, so that's why I, I say I think God is in need of more gardeners than guards when it comes to his work in the world. And, you know, I think we've got a huge plethora of guards <laughs> yep. in the body of Christ. They've been trained I, you know, to be very afraid. Exactly. And it's all, afraid. it's exactly what you say. It's all motivated by fear. I, I don't know why, but I have this um, habit of <laughs> on my way home from work, I'll turn on conservative Christian radio talk shows. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different channels. I live in Nashville. And so there's all these Christian radio stations. And so I'll just turn on different ones and, it amazes me day after day after day. And this is just, I, I'm, I'm not pointing this towards a particular group of people or person or whatever, but you can just hear the fear. It's all, it's chicken little all over again. The sky's falling, you know, Jesus has got to come soon because it's getting so bad. And it just makes the gospel this really ugly fire insurance policy that I don't think it was intended to be. You, you talk about, which this was a fascinating part of the book for me that I want to pick your brain about a little bit. When you talk about eunuchs and the trajectory of the Bible, we've been talking a lot on this podcast about the trajectory. That word trajectory, if, if there was one word over the last year or two that would describe our podcast, I think that would be it, of seeing the Bible and the life of faith, not as this static thing, but and not, not looking at what the Bible says, 
but instead the trajectory of the Bible. And you really pointed this out, I thought, wonderfully in talking about the Ethiopian eunuch and how in the Old Testament, eunuchs were excluded from, from the life of the, the community of faith. They were excluded from the Jewish religion. They couldn't handle the scripture. They couldn't go into the presence of God. And how we find Philip being being put in this place simply for this Ethiopian eunuch and how God lets this eunuch who was rejected under the old covenant and, and <clears throat> completely written out how he's let into the kingdom. And it really raised a number of questions for me. And this is, I mean, these are things that I've been processing for the last few years anyway. So, so the book just kind of reaffirms some things for me in the sense of God's kingdom continually I wish the the listeners at home could see what I'm doing, but having this this arc to it where it goes from smaller to larger, where it's always expanding, it's always, and, and you actually say this in the book, that it's the parable of the mustard seed. It's not just the growth, but it's the fact that the kingdom's not just going to grow in, in number. numerically. It's going to grow in nature. It's, exactly, it's that it's going to grow in nature. Yeah. Um, so with that said, that the kingdom's getting bigger and bigger, you know, we have questions in the church. For instance, the probably the hottest issue in the church right now is that of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we look in the old covenant and we see that, that women were um, considered to be property, that slavery was okay, that eunuchs and people of other religions were not allowed in the, in the, in the kingdom of God. Then we get to like the new covenant. We see that there's no Jew, no Gentile. We see eunuchs are allowed. We see, you know, the, the trajectory seems to be way more inclusive. Jesus is, you know, the new Joshua that's instead of committing genocide against, you know, the, uh, the Amalekites, he's actually welcoming the Samaritan woman, those of other religions. With that said, what do you think is, um, how, what do you think the church's stance towards homosexuality should be? And not just homosexuality but also people of other religions as far as welcoming them into the community of, of faith? Um, That's a big question, Shane. Yeah, Sorry, I that's think, awful word. I think <laughs> that Christians should approach um, homosexuals the same way they approach um, uh, humans who are obese, humans who are rich, humans who are kind, humans who are cruel. Um, so I don't know. How, how do we deal with them? Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's... It may be the hottest topic in Christianity. It is undoubtedly the least interesting in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, just, I, I, I don't, I don't fully, I understand that genitals are frightening to most people. And so, <laughs> so we get really, really worked up about this issue. And I understand yeah. that. Um, I'm not one of them who, who gets terribly worked up over it. I, I also am quite comfortable with some people. I don't need to force it on them. So, some people who are really, really faithful, committed, loving Christians cannot reconcile uh, the fact that a gay lifestyle is okay. And I'd like to say to them, then you're free to hold that. Yeah. We don't need to dismantle that for you, as long as you're okay not forcing everyone else to agree with you. Yeah. So I'll protect yeah. your right to believe whatever you need to believe, as long as you also protect the right of others to believe differently. The last thing I would say is I don't understand why we make it a criterion for exclusion. Yeah. That, that I just don't understand it at all. I have no awareness of why it would be a criterion for exclusion. Um, we, we, we make a very, very bizarre kind of arbitrary lines around what is a criterion for exclusion and what's one for inclusion. And for some reason, where one's genitals go is the criterion for exclusion. <laughs> I just it doesn't seem to be the the way of Jesus in my mind, but that's what do I know? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think the I think you're right. I think the church has this hyper fascination with sex in a really unhealthy way, where sexual sins are always you know the biggies, and, and not just sins, but you know even virginity. I mean, the the premium that's put on virginity in the body of Christ, it, it's it's really unhealthy and I've seen, I've seen all sorts of, it's also uh, an illusion. It, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. If you read any statistics, it's absolutely an illusion, but you know, the, the sense that we, um, that we put this premium on virginity and the way that we talk about it as if, you know, once it's lost, you can never get it back. This is something, you know, it's like 
we, we make it into this thing that when we have young girls and young boys, especially young girls though, um, that lose their virginity. It's as if they've transgressed this line to which they can never come back. You know, you can never give it away twice. They'll talk about, and it just seems like it's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you. The fascination with sex is really, <laughs> it's really kind of it's, problematic. It's a powerful thing. Sex is a powerful thing, and it can be very confusing. Desire is a powerful, confusing thing. I, I'm not unsympathetic to the complexity, the confusion, the pain, the trauma. There is a great deal that goes along with it. I'm all for having in, intense, serious conversations around what is constructive and healthy sexuality. Sure. Fine. I just don't, I don't personally spend a lot of time in that in delineating um, that in any way. I would just say, uh, is there a sexual sin that is gay? Certainly. Is there sexual sin that is straight? Certainly. <laughs> so that's fine Absolutely. with me. I also happen to have the category of the possibility that there's God honoring gay sexuality, but I don't actually have a need for everyone else to agree with me on that. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, I think the most of all the sections of your book, the most the one that had probably ministered to me the most and the one that I'm most um, am identifying with right now, simply because it's, it's just where I'm at in my, in my thoughts and in my heart is where you talk about the anonymous giver. Mm -hmm. I, I just thought that was such a powerful way of saying it. Can you talk some about that and, uh, and how God is an anonymous giver? Um, when I was, uh, in, in the church, I hear a lot the phrase, you know, in the name of Jesus. And it's very, very important for Christians. The Bible, in fairness, talks a lot about the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Um, but I think Christians have misunderstood the importance of the name of Jesus. They have invested it with powers um, as though the name itself is the only carrier of the power. I'm not suggesting that the name doesn't carry power. I suspect it does. I'm suggesting that it is not the exclusive power. In other words, if I believe that, that the name of Jesus is where the power lies, that also means that I can withhold Jesus when I want. Mm. This is a profound arrogance and a dangerous one. And so this is where I, I love to tell the story of um, when I was at a museum, I saw a, a donor wall and a whole bunch of bricks in a wall with names. And some bricks were different sizes, which indicated, you know, some people gave more money than others. And there was one brick that simply said anonymous. And I was struck by it because I thought, well, why would they even, you know, put anonymous? And it was like they were crediting something. But then it occurred to me, what's quite remarkable about it is this person had no need to be recognized. And yet, without any recognition, they were able to make an impact. Their power was felt in an institution without their name ever being mentioned. Mm. And I looked at that and wondered, how true is this of Jesus? Mm. His ability to give gifts without anyone knowing his name or asking his name. Mm. I, I love the moment where Jesus heals the blind man um, with mud. Again, we get really fixated on the healing and the miracle and, oh, he put mud and he spit. and he, what, What's the symbolism of that? He had to wash in the pool of Siloam. What's the symbolism of that? And I, what I find most remarkable is the guy didn't ask to be healed. Mm. He just walks up and unilaterally spits in his face, heals him, and walks away. He doesn't say, here's my card. It's Jesus. J-E-S-U-S. -S. Remember it. <laughs> Make sure you spell it Here's right Here's my now. <laughs> Twitter account. Make sure you promote. Make sure everybody knows I'm the one who did it. And by the way, do you know my name? Because if you don't know my name, I can't help you. This mm. is the thing that's so extraordinary to me. So why on earth do we think that Jesus has no power to help you without his name? Jesus mm. was helping me long before I knew his name. Wow. And that's why that Footprints poem to this day, continues to be one of the most powerful poems. It's full of cliche, and it's all kinds of crazy to me. When I see it and read it, it is, the, it is truth. I look at it and go, yeah. you carried me before I knew your name. Yeah. You didn't even yeah. need me to know your name. You didn't even need me to thank you. Yeah. You still wanted yeah. to give to me. And guess what? Humans do this. How much more could the God of the universe do this? Yeah. If we are yeah. patterned after him, why not? So, um, 
that's why that's another reason why I think Christianity's claim to exclusively owning Jesus is sort of not useful. Um, yeah. Because what what on earth makes you think that he couldn't be operating right now in a Hindu's life in the most powerful, yeah. wonderful ways without that Hindu ever knowing it's Jesus? Absolutely. How how, how limited do we think this Jesus is? How small Absolutely. is your Jesus that you think he isn't capable? of living and dying with a Buddhist and the Buddhist never saying his name. Mm. Mm. That's so good. <laughs> That's so good. It reminds me so much of, uh, there's, there's an author that I really like James Douglas. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a peace activist, um, down in Alabama, but anyway, he he's written some great stuff, but he said that he spent, I, I guess he's in his seventies now. And he said, you know, I've spent most of my adult life, trying to figure out how the greatest disciple of Jesus in his mind was a Hindu speaking of Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's just, you can't look at someone like Gandhi and go, Jesus didn't touch that guy. Jesus didn't influence that guy. Jesus didn't, he wasn't, you, you, I would have a hard time saying Gandhi wasn't a disciple of Jesus, whether or not he knew it. That's, (laughs) that's irrelevant. And you know, it seems like, it's so funny how in evangelicalism we have a tendency to uh, use people use people as we as we want to without referring to their whole body of work. But someone like C.S. Lewis, who evangelicals love, you know, you read the end of the Chronicles of Narnia and you find Aslan, who is really all embracing of all of these different people who never knew his name, who never knew him, and you know this has been the trajectory for me the last several years of moving from this really limited view of, of Jesus to where he's the exclusive property of the Christian faith to where he's out there working among those who don't recognize him and among those who uh, don't know him and among those who will never speak his name and that they are just as much in relationship with him as myself, who recognizes his name. So, and that's such a profound thought. So I think, um, I think we would be well served to remember the prologue of John, which is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. And the, the Word there is Logos, and this is the creative, infinite power of the universe. For It's not words, like we, that's rhema in Greek, so Logos means something different philosophically, theologically. Um, but the, the idea is that, that Christ pre-existed creation. And what that means is Christ, the, the, the power of this energy called Christ that pre-existed all of creation manifested in fullness in a guy by the name of Jesus who mm-hmm. lived for a few years and then died. But this power of Christ did not die with him. It was not born with him. This power of Christ transcends even the person of Jesus. We just venerate rightly Jesus because he was, frankly, uniquely, uniquely uh, a vessel for this Christ. But I, I happen to believe that if this Christ preexisted all of time and creation, then I would find that the spirit of Christ animated Buddha, and the spirit of mm-hmm. Christ must have been in Krishna, and the spirit of Christ must have been in uh, Hafez and Rumi, and the, the spirit of Christ in varying degrees is in me. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. some of us mm-hmm. just have are a whole lot less afraid, and so more of it courses through us. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I, that's why I sort of think it's funny when, he, when Jesus says, Jesus is trying to point to this Christ. He's saying to his disciples, God, make them one with you as you and I are one. Help them become like me, because I am no different than they. They have the same vehicle, vessel that I have, this human body. And it is unfortunately closed like a hose, kinked off to this love, to this Christ. And I don't care what words you use to describe it. Um, it, it doesn't have words. It pre-exists language. So whether you give it the name water or Christ or Vishnu or whatever, I don't care. This power, I believe, is manifest uniquely in history in Jesus, but not exclusively in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's... It's so funny how, it's so funny how, as as you walk with him, and you begin, like you said, you walk towards love. As you walk towards love, that you you have to end up. I'm, I don't I don't mean this in a 
condescending way towards anyone else, but I'm just saying it feels like you have to end up in a more open view of God because you realize he's just too big to be contained in one little vessel. And, and in saying that, you know, more and more I'm thinking that Jesus to me, it seems like so much of Christianity has been concerned as, as you talk about the guardians instead of the gardeners, we've been concerned to protect the revelation given in Jesus. But to me, I, I'm with you, Shane. I think the very revelation of Jesus is that God's desire is to incarnate himself, is to reveal himself through humanity. That's the revelation of Jesus. So why would it surprise us that he wants to do that in you and that he wants to do that in me? Yep. It seems like that's the trajectory. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. So much good stuff. Guys, you got to go by the book, Selling Water by the River, a book about the life Jesus promised and the religion that gets in the way with Shane Hips. Shane, thank you so, so very much. This has been excellent. Thanks so much for all your time. Oh, it was a real pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Well, that was a great conversation with Shane Hips. Shane, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast and for taking the time to share your thoughts and your heart. There's just so much, <laughs> so much to chew on in this podcast, especially there at the last where we're talking about the spirit of Christ. I know that's something I'm going to have to go and chew on myself. Um, that's something that we can get choked on if we're not careful, because it almost seems like we're denying Jesus. But in reality, I think what we're trying to do, or at least I, I can't speak for Shane, but I can speak for myself. And I think probably Steve as well is to say that. I think what what we're what Steve and I are trying to do is to say look Jesus came to show us not only the father but he came to show us us. He came to show us that there was something not just special about him but there was something innate to the human race. Something about the spirit of God that was breathed in us in creation that has a divine spark on the inside of us and that while that divine spark might be fallen, that divine spark might be marred, it's still there. And so it manifests itself in cultures and people all throughout the world. So it really goes back to that old saying of all truth is God's truth. The fact that we're going to find something of the spirit of Christ in all periods of time and, and truly in people of all cultures because the spirit of Christ was not something that was simply confined to the human Jesus. But as scripture itself says, Jesus was the only begotten of the Father. But after the resurrection, we read later that Jesus came that God might receive many children. So that we've been begotten of God as well. So Jesus came to, maybe, maybe we could just say it as Jesus came as the only son so that he would no longer be an only son. So that there would be a family of many children. And I just appreciate, Shane, your insights about the Spirit of Christ. Such uh, just stuff I'm going to have to go back and chew on. So much good stuff that I've been thinking about lately. Very much in the direction that I've been thinking, but maybe stated in a different way. So thank you so much for taking the time. Folks, thank you so much for taking the time, not only to listen to the podcast, but also to share your heart and your thoughts. So many of you contact us and tell us about how this podcast is resonating with you, how the ideas that we talk about, the conversations we have, are many times the conversations that, that either you're having with someone else or maybe that you're having in your own head that you've been too scared to say out loud. So I just hope that these ideas... Um, not just resonate with you in the sense that, that we can have an echo chamber, but just, just the fact that you can find resonance with us so that it will like almost like breadcrumbs on the journey that will keep you going towards God and will keep you from feeling like you're alone and you're out there. And maybe you're the only person who's thinking these things, but that you can realize that there's a lot of us out there that are being drawn in this direction. And I do think it's a drawing. I don't think it's something that we're making up. I don't think it's something that we're coming up with our on our own. I really think this is a drawing from God. So Anyway, many ways to contact us. As usual, I'll do the drill. <laughs> you can go on Facebook, facebook.com slash beyond the box. That's our page where we have all of our discussions. Please go over there and just jump in the dialogue. If you see a thread there that you want to that, that comment on, 
please jump in. It doesn't matter if it's an old thread. Start the conversation again. Let's get it reignited. Or maybe you've got some thoughts of your own that you would like to put out there for the community to talk about and to, and to bounce around. It really is a great place to go for conversation, to, to really test some ideas, to experiment with some ideas, and to get other people's feedback. So I want to encourage you to do that. Facebook.com slash Beyond the Box. You can get our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash BTB Podcast. Um, go to our website, beyondtheboxpodcast.com. You can comment on episodes there. You can leave idea submissions. And if we haven't responded to your idea submission or to your comments, please know that we do read those. Steve and I both read those, and we really, really do enjoy your thoughts. We really enjoy your ideas. We've had some great ideas coming in lately that I would like to explore the possibility of doing some podcasts on in the future. Um, while you're there, go over to the Call Me widget on the website. You'll see it on the right-hand side of the screen. It just says Call Me. If you click that and you put in your phone number and your name, our answering service will call you back so you can leave a message. Or you can just call the number directly at 626-246-6269. Um, for you short, <laughs> for people that just want to remember something easy, it's 626-24-NO-BOX. Um, if you want to pull over on the side of the road and call us right now, leave a comment. Uh, just either tell us about this episode, maybe something you agreed with, something you didn't agree with, something that you would um, like like to see explored for, further. Boy, I'm getting my tongue twisted tonight. Um, or if you have ideas submissions that you want to leave there, please do. Another thing also that Steve and I would both love for you to do is if you'll go there and say, Hi, my name is Ray from... And then you can say where you're from and you're listening to beyond the box. We would just love to throw that on the front end of our episodes and just hear from different people in the podcast community all over. Uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Shane, again, thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast today. And until next time, this is Ray and my partner, Steve is out there somewhere <laughs> in uh, listening and podcasting land. And hopefully we'll get behind the mic soon and bring you another one. You guys have a great week. Thanks so much for being with us.